So let's get started with our first presentation. Uh, we have two very experienced and knowledgeable radiation safety officers here to give us an RSO update. Although one specializes primarily in therapy um, and the other specializes primary in, primarily in imaging, they both cover imaging and therapy at their institutions and they can give us information from an academic center perspective and also community practice and consulting uh, perspective. So first up is Dean Broga. Okay, so uh, as we said, these, these are our course objectives. Beth and I are going to cover these and probably run, run awry a couple of times. But we're trying to refresh you on the, the RSO requirements for the regulatory bodies, and I'll preference that, that most of you know that there's variances from state to states. Most of the states are agreement states, and they change or alter or push on one thing more than they push on another thing. And many of the states have some requirements, other states don't, so we're, we're going to generalize in that regard. We're going to talk about the RSO as a physician authorized user, which is typical in most community hospitals. And one of the things that I will dwell on a fair about is when you are a medical physicist consulting with a community hospital that has an authorized user physician as the RSO, you usually end up being the one who's overseeing most of the stuff that's going on from a regulatory point of view. They're relying on you. They're just signing papers. You're the one who's bearing the responsibility. And that brings up some unique issues, too. And we'll be looking at the typical RSO responsibilities in a radiation safety program. It's content applied to a clinical environment. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is an expanding practice. I think most people are familiar that there's a new JCH um, radi radiological section coming out in, ju in July, and it has a lot of requirements for medical physicists in it. I don't know that we've seen the final part, but it's going to up the game in this whole process as well. So. We're going to provide a broad overview of the RSO's responsibilities. We're going to identify the regulatory requirements applicable to the Medical Radiation Protection Program. We're going to expect the expanding scope of the Radiation Safety Committee and its responsibilities under both regulatory and accrediting organizations, and I should say also corporate organizations or corporate requirements for Radiation Safety Committees now. And we're going to address the expanding role of the Radiation Safety Responsibility for the consulting medical physicists. And Beth threw, Beth threw this slide together, and this kind of pictures all the people that are in the party that we're dealing with. They all have some input, either directly or by reference from state or federal standard, and they impact the decisions that you make every day. I'm not going to go into that to detail. I think most of you are familiar with those things. And I see almost everybody, I see more than that. In a, in a medical research institution because you're dealing with animals too, and that brings in a whole other realm. So the Radiation Protection Program. So each licensee is, shall develop a program and implement the Radiation Protection commensurate with the scope and extent of their license activities, which is sufficiently to ensure compliance with the provisions of Part 20.202, which is by reference included in most state regulations. And so I chose this. Virginia was smart when it rewrote its agreement state regulations to reference the code, the, the federal regulations, so that they don't have to update their regulations all the time. If the feds change the standard, it's automatic in Virginia. Whereas in some states have to wait till the next promulgation. Well, they have a deadline as an agreement state, and they have to re-promulgate that part of their standard, which is a pain. Okay. A licensee shall, shall use to the extent practical procedures and engineering controls based on sound radiation protection principles to achieve occupational doses and doses to the member of the public that are ALARA. We've seen a lot of emphasis in the last few years of including in the annual review doses to the public in that annual review process. The licensee shall periodically, at least annually, revive, review the radiation protection program content and implementation and write a report on it. Usually this is, at least in my practice, and I don't know Beth's practice, one of the things expected of the consultant physicist to do at a, at a uh, small hospice, obviously required at a large medical institution. Okay, the licensee management shall appoint a radiation safety officer who agrees in writing to be responsible for implementing the radiation protection program. The licensee through the radiation safety officer shall ensure the radiation safety activities are being performed in accordance with the license approved procedures and regulatory requirements. I still struggle, but the state now in license renewal or new license absolutely requires a copy of the written agreement between the RSO and the license. And that agreement should designate the, not only the RSO's responsibilities, but as authority to act on behalf of the institution. Green, go green. Okay. 
A licensee shall provide a radiation safety officer sufficient authority, organizational freedom, time, that's an interesting one in community hospitals, resources and management prerogative to identify radiation safety problems, initiate, recommend, or provide corrective action, stop unsafe operations, and verify implementation of corrective <coughs> actions. Now, these are obviously right out of the regs, and um, that is the expectation, okay? A licensee shall establish the authority, duties, and responsibilities of the radiation software in writing to activities involving licensed material for the RSO considered unsafe are stopped. So the RSO has to have the authority to go and say, you need to stop this, uh, which can be a controversial issue in a, in a hospital. Ensure radiation exposures are allowed, and we'll talk about how that's done through the committee process later on. Update radiation protection procedures in the daily operations of the licensed byproduct material program are developed, distributed, and implemented. This usually falls to the medical physicists. Most radiologists don't know what's going on in updating procedures. Possession, use, and storage of licensed materials are consistent with the limitations in the license, the regulations, the SSDR certification, and the manufacturer's recommendations and instructions. Radiologists don't know that. It falls to the medical physicist to look at with probably the chief of uh, nuclear medicine section or therapy. Individuals installing, relocating, maintaining, adjusting, and repairing devices containing sealed sources are trained in authority with, by the NRC or state agreement license. That falls into play when you're getting someone to come repair sources that are controlled under the security initiative of the NRC, like gamma nice and HDRs that people coming in, you know who they are, and they're licensed and authorized to do that. In fact, with the bigger sources, Beth will touch on that. There's some other, or I'm, I'm, you're going to touch on that, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and uh, a licensee shall establish authority, duty, and responsibility of the radius nature in writing. The personal training is conducted and is commensurate with the individual's duties regarding licensed material. This is always a challenging issue in hospitals because that time variant is very different from facility to facility, from five minutes to an hour and a half. Documentation is maintained to demonstrate the individuals are not likely to receive in one year a radiation dose in, except in excess of 10% of the allowable limits for personal monitoring devices are provided. So not only annually but quarterly we're looking at that requirement too in the RSC and we're providing um, documentation of review of people that are exceeding that limit. When necessary, personal monitoring devices are used and exchanged at the proper intervals and recorded uh, records of the real results are monitored and maintained. And the new joint commission standard that's coming out, at, again, charges that a quarterly responsibility. And they also have a section very adamant about looking at badges are being returned in a timely fashion and you're filling in when badges aren't returned for some average exposure in the interim where the badges weren't present, which some hospitals are doing and not doing, but the Joint Commission has recently said that what they put out for this July is their first in a series of updates in the radiological standard. So it's not going to get e hard, uh, easier, it's going to get harder, they're going to ratchet down. Um, and licensed material is properly secured, so that's always been a big to-do with state inspections that somebody's not put the sources in the right place or the hot lab door is not closed and someone can't see it or someone left the therapy area open, went to get a cup of coffee, that kind of issue has always been a big deal with the state. Okay, documentation is maintained to documentation is maintained to demonstrate by measurement or calculation that the total effective dose equivalent to an individual likely to receive the highest dose from a licensed operation does not exceed the annual limit for members of the public. So. Um, we're seeing more ratcheting down on that. The new Joint Commission standard has a section that if you change equipment in a room, the medical physics has, physicist has to review the room and do a survey after it's put in. So there's another jump up in requirements in hospitals for all of us. Proper authorities are notified of incidents such as loss of theft or licensed material damage or malfunction of sealed sources. And that, will, that is the bigger issue, I'm sure, with the therapy sources, as we know, and I think you'll touch on that. Uh, issue as far as local annual requirements. Medical events and precursor events are investigated and reported to the NRC and cause the appropriate corrective action are identified and timely corrective actions are taken. Documentation, documentation, a authorized user radiologist probably won't know any of this. You'll be charged with it. Audits of the radiation program are performed at least annually and documented. Okay, the, the, see this big list. When If you gave this to radiologists, they start choking. So this is what you have to do, <laughs> they start joking. If violations of regulations and licensing conditions or program weaknesses are identified, effective corrective actions are developed and implemented and documented. Licensed material is transported 
or offered for transportation in accordance with all applicable DOT requirements. That's been in the last year a big issue with the feds from a number of agencies with us coming in on DOT training. And I don't know nationally, but in our state, they'll come and pull the papers at the airport and come back to see if you've got all the proper documentation. Not just radioactive, but other issues as well we'll talk about. Licensed material disposed of properly, always an issue um, at an institution. Most community hospitals have uh, decay in storage or return it to the pharmacy, but occasionally they will have to get rid of sources by shipping them and the DOT applicable regulations will come into play. Appropriate records are maintained again and up-to-date license is maintained and amended and renewed requests are submitted in a timely manner. The biggest issue I have with that in, in a lot of hospitals, community hospitals that are sharing group physicians is we have 35 named authorized users in a hospital that are covering seven other hospitals and we need to know who died, retired, or joined the group because you're supposed to notify the state within 30 days of that action. Um, I also found out in that context with licensing, our state has decided that sharing the names of people on a license, it used to be if you wanted to add a physician to your license and he was on St. Gertrude's Hospital, you asked for a copy of the license and then said, well, he's named on St. Gertrude, so then he can be named on our license, blah, blah, blah. Now the state that's decided that's a violation of HIPAA law. So you cannot share a license that has people's names on it. You just have to get the license number and, and call the state and have it verified. That just happened last week, the changing market. I went, a HIPAA violation, okay. New to me. I don't know. I mean, you don't, you don't argue. It's like, you know, um, as an aside, which we'll have many, we have a rule in our state promulgated by the group opinion of the state regulators that if you have a dental practice, you have to have a lead apron. Well, technically, the only required protective material in a dental practice is to shield the gonads. And I called them up and said, you know, because we had a dentist who didn't want to buy one and they weren't going to certify his operation. And he called me. I said, well, this, that's not a legal requirement. They said, I called them up. I said, when are the gonads in the field of view in dentistry? I mean, I'm just like really confused by this. Because I don't understand. The regulations say that, you know, the gonads have to be in the field of view. And they just said, well, we think this is a good idea, so we're going to require it. You know, well, now you can choose to fight them, or you can tell the dentist, too bad, you got to buy an apron. You know, the only one, but you got to buy an apron. So, you know, we, we were always dealing with those interpretive issues. Um, I know, and I was going to say, with regard to the badge system, in our last Joint Commission review, well, I go through about 15 a year, but the last one I went through with us, I got interrogated by the guy about our badge returns, timely returns, what do we do about physicians who didn't return it when some badge was missing, how did we average it in? And the guy was no authority about it, let me tell you, it was, it was like talking to my wife about it. But that's okay. <laughs> licenses that are unauthorized for, uh, licenses that are authorized for, let's talk about the Radiation Safety Committee. So most facilities are gonna have a Radiation Safety Committee either by the regulatory requirement for radioactive material or because the Joint Commission is requiring it or the state is requiring it. Now technically in a small outpatient like cardiac clinic that only has one area of use, they don't have to have a radiation safety committee. But if you have a medical institution, they're gonna have a radiation safety committee. This establishes that if a licensee has two or more areas of authorized use, then they have to have a radiation safety committee, and the committee must include an authorized user from each, each area of use, which is always challenging in some hospitals. The radiation safety officer, a representative from the nursing services, a representative of management who is neither the authorized user or the radiation safety officer, and other members as appropriate. So most committees get expanded to cover some of the other areas that we have, but and, and the regulations require a quorum, and if, the, uh, if those, at least the RSO and the administrative representative aren't there, they don't consider it a quorum. So you can't have a radiation safety committee without the RSO. And most of my facilities don't have a radiation safety committee without the medical physicist, because there's just too many issues on the table that have to be discussed that, need, that you need the physicist there. So here's um, what, what I've crafted for clients as a typical RSC agenda to start with uh, and pair off depending on what your issues are. So I have review of the minutes of the previous minute, the committee, which is always uh, important, unfinished business needs to be addressed. Both the Joint Commission and the state regulators don't like stuff to just drop off the radar. Something came up for discussion, Joe Blow was supposed to go look into it, and then it's never seen on the minutes again. Okay, so you need closure on items. They just can't trail off into time. 
Um, so unfinished business is usually the first thing and it's really, you know, I take a fair amount of time to review the minutes to make sure they're not missing something because you get caught in this all the time. Something was left out that was supposed to be reviewed or followed up and both those, and if you get CMS come in also with the Joint Commission, they'll pick up on it and take you to ta task on it. Then we have standing reports, your LARA review for the symmetry reports, which include looking at, you know, people over LARA level one and two and discussing it specifically, review of bioassay measurements that have been made, made in the last quarter, any incidents that have occurred in the last quarter in any of the areas which the licensee is operating, any medical events that may have occurred, and any spills or accidental exposures that may have occurred in the last quarter. So those are all covered in those standing reports. Quarterly reviews and quality assurance, usually by the RSO or the medical physicist, they involve the areas in which they practice, which would be in most of my facilities, nuclear medicine, diagnostic radiology, mammography, radiation oncology. Uh, as I said, with the institution, the, the Joint Commission is going to have this in July, but CT dose tracking is already in place in many facilities, fluoro dose tracking, and major repair tracking is in there. Now, some of the wording that's in the Joint Commission may add a few more sections to that because they have some ambiguous statements about image quality evaluation programs that are not defined at all. Review of any notices, circulars, regulatory guides, or changes that are going to affect that, that licensee that are coming up is important. And we always have review of authorized users lists, actually make the users list appear at the committee and, and ask the physicians there, you know, has anybody left your group, died, or you added anybody that we need to change here? Also, what that authorized user list covers the areas each person is authorized for specifically in their practice. Um, the annual and semi-annual review of contamination and exposure levels is listed to the RSO, but it's usually done by the physicist when he's reviewing the areas to uh, assure that all the required surveys are being done and all the levels are within permissible limits. And the semi-annual review of the radiation safety program as to its appropriateness is usually done at the time, at every six months as well. Excuse me. Uh, standing reports that are done annually is annual programmatic review of the program, which is done with the R by the RSO, but technically the medical physicist. The annual review of the written directives, the annual review of Part 21, if it's applicable in your state. The annual review of the emergency response program for the facility. The annual review of lead apron testing and tracking. The annual review of the training program, both the general and departmental specific. And there may be other annual issues that are added in there in your licensees, but. We're trying to make the radiation safety a one-stop meeting, a one-stop place to address all of the issues that are arising today on the global market of control that's got out by either the, the regulatory or the accrediting bodies. The new business and then next scheduled meetings, obviously, there. So the RSO authority, a licensee is to provide the radiation safety officer sufficient authority and organizational freedom to identify radiation safety problems, initiate recommendations, stop unsafe operations, verify implementation of corrective actions. This usually doesn't come to head unless there's a disagreement. Cardiology doesn't want to do this, uh, the oncologist doesn't want to do that. What, what the, these kind of political jurisdictional issues often become problems at community hospitals and big hospitals as well, I should say. Okay, so that was an overview of the RSO and the RSC as I see it, um, constantly expanding. I am seeing uh, some physician authorized RSOs starting to get really edgy about being an RSO, starting to be concerned that they ought to be compensated by their group for being an RSO because it's become encumbering compared to what their partners are doing. And uh, that may drive in the long run the, the need for facilities to bring in someone, a consultant medical physicist, or I think uh, they might consider using medical physicists as RSOs depending on the state's limitations. I know there was one medical physicist in one state who was RSO at like 60 facilities or something before the state said enough is enough. Okay, so. Um, but th that I think is going to be an, a, an expanding problem is who's willing to take on all those responsibilities. There's the Joint Commission, CMS, the state, and other organizations ratchet down on this person. So now we're going to talk about nuclear medicine. All right. Nuclear medicine requirements, we're going to talk about patient dose records, decay and storage, seal source inventory, seal source leak test, dose calibrated geometry, constancy, linearity, and accuracy, and receipt. 
which are all in the regulations. So patient dose records are a, a tricky thing, depending on the, how the facility is running. We have, you have the old paper records. A lot of people have gone with pharmacies that have scanning records so that everything's scanned in when you receive the dose. But that doesn't alleviate you from the requirements of the regulations, which are listed here and probably most of you are familiar with. But you need to check that they are available and that if you're using an electronic system, there's some kind of trackable signature control verification for the people who are cr creating those records. You should have a signature record that identifies individuals, their signature, and their initials, and their electronic initials if they're using them. That's available to the regulatory if they want to see it. Yep. Yeah, just real quick. And I love questions on the fly because I'm. Just yeah. A yeah. Right. Yeah, I, when people, there's the federal retention standard, which I will say is the retention standard, but I would then default to the hospital's risk management. People decide what, they're, what they feel comfortable with if there's a legal situation, because this is not going to exculpate you from the problem if you get challenged legally on these issues. So I don't think you have to keep them forever, but you, you know, what is the time record on those with phone? I don't follow, I just tell my and, clients, go to their pharmacy, find out. Yeah. Yeah, and this is the kind of variance. Well, I'll mention a couple of things that Virginia changed too that caught everybody, uh, you know, shorthanded when they changed the regulations. So decay in storage again, the federal retention or state retention time if they took the feds is three years. You need the data disposal, the material was placed in storage, radionuclide disposition, survey meter use, background level of the meter, exposure rate from the material, and the individual performed. The disposal. This is always a challenge. You know, the expectation used to be that material was held for 10 half lives. I usually just use that as a rule of thumb rather than letting people say they monitored it and it was down to background. This can get into a tricky situation if you have a smart regulator who starts arguing about, you know, what's the minimum detectable of the survey meter that you're using and was that really background when you threw it away, which can be an interesting discussion. Depending on what you choose to survey your waste with, you can find it at background or not. So, but that definitely needs to all be in a record book, and they would look down and say, here's the date it was placed in decay, here's the date it was disposed of. We would hope that that's at least 10 half lives. Um, it can be less with some material, but it's just rule of thumb. You won't have problems with people inadequately monitoring if you still use that rule that's not in the regulations anymore. And so we have sealed source inventories. The, this varies from state to state. I think with the feds it used to be 10 years and the state dropped it to five years when they changed the regulations which immediately put half the people in state in violation because they had, were on a 10 year cycle and more than five years had expired. So um, if you're having a sealed source inventory you've got to go through usually quarterly or semi-annually depending on the state and inventory all the sources you have. What I run into problems with is people who put, take sources and told me they sent them back but they're really under the shelf and then the state comes in and pulls the whole hot lab apart and finds, you know, five little check sources that are under the counter that aren't on the inventory that somebody forgot about. Okay, so you almost need the first time you go to a facility to do that because they'll tell you, I went to a facility they had some of, there was one disk source in this thing and the state took it and dumped out and there were three in there. You know, they hadn't listed the two below the one they, on the top they were taking account of. So, you, you know, then the state goes into, you know, uh, FBI mode, there's a major crimes occurred. <laughs> they were all, in fact, they were all ba background sources they just had better to throw away, but that was another issue. Okay, so the sealed source leak test, now this is what I meant, Fi the sealed source leak test is, is a five-year retention time, and there's a storage requirement, and again, model, serial number, rate of nuclide. Most people who have semi, this is required semi-annually in most states, so when they're doing this, if they have semi-annual semi inventory, they're also doing this leak test. Usually this is done, or at least in my practice, I do this just to make sure it gets done right. Um, it's a simple thing of just taking a swipe of the sources and counting an appropriate detector. Um, but you do need to demonstrate the, the method that you use and you do need to demonstrate, which may be in my next slide, that you can detect the ma maximum, minimum detectable activity required for that leak test. And that's something you should be able to demonstrate by calculation with sources. If it's required to be two 
2 times 10 to the minus fifth microcuries, you'd, you'd be able to just demonstrate the methodology you're using can detect that. That would occur on any swipe that you're taking. Just simply saying, oh, I counted on that meter is not good enough. Okay. And that, if you look in the regulatory guide, is the typical formulation for minimum detectable activity, act, uh, the levels that's positive or negative, and the uh, lowest counting level. It's basically just a variance of background and efficiencies on your system. It's in the reg guides if you don't have it. All the slides are in the handouts, which are available electronically. Okay, the dose calibrator geometry uh, is due at the time of uh, installation. If you move it, if you send it back for repair, it has to be done on the loaner. Uh, this is often a problem. I have people falling short of their, their uh, dose calibrator goes bad, which is not a common factor, but they have to send it back, which is now classified as a type HDOT transport because it's considered a compressed cylinder. And so anybody returning a dose calibrator, I'm, I'm not saying you, you can't do it if you don't get caught, but if they catch you, it's considered a type H transport. And type H training is, you, have to be, you can get it online, but that's the problem you have in sending it back to them if you do. But anyway, so if you get a loaner, then you got to do this on the loaner, then you got to do it on the unit you get back, okay? I've never seen a dose calibrator fail a geometry test, but it should be done for the size syringes that are used and if they constitute kits for the size vial they use to constitute the kit. So use like a one millimeter, three millimeter, and 20 millimeter vial, it should be on the test and it's that one time and it's good forever or until you get a new dose calibrator. The constancy test is done daily uh, by ANSI standards and again you have the requirements for documentation here. Usually what I do is provide an expect an ex a sheet with an Excel spreadsheet with expected range plus and minus for them to fill in and it just runs down each day. Some people who don't do uh, other channels will include their cesium weekly test on this every day just so they don't have to do the weekly uh, channel check. And again, you've got to have the activity, and the primary source must be at least 50 microcuries. So when I run out the sheets, if it gets below 50 microcuries, the data just disappears. There's not, they'll come up, there's no more data on the sheet. That's because you need a new source. That's why this, um, we don't run into the problem of them continuing to run the dose below 50 microcuries. Okay, linearity, quarterly, um, the requirements there, you're supposed to carry it down to the 30 microcurry range. If you do linearity tests, I probably process 30 or 40 a quarter. Um, you'll, you'll know that in the low range, the background is very important uh, when the source is taken out and you'll flunk the test many times in this range because they didn't adequately monitor the dose, the background in that setting. Does anybody know why linearity was originally put in as a test? Bob! <laughs> Do you, nobody? It was a test of the battery. The batteries that run the dose calibrator will lose the ability to hold the field if they're not strong enough. The early dose calibrators didn't have a test button which gives you the voltage on the battery, which should be at least 140 in most models. If it dropped lower, the lower doses would be right, but when you put in higher activities, they would under-respond and give you lower values than the actual dose. That's why it was put in play. Um, it, when they put the battery test on, it seemed, then they said, well, let's check the scaling of the unit, blah, 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 blah. I have never had a linearity test fail that wasn't a technologist error. It's a kind, I kind of ask, you know, it's like why we check the fire extinguishers every week. It's, you know, haven't had a failure in 20 years, but that's okay. So, um, and this needs to be documented, usually signed by the medical physicist or the RSO. The biggest thing is getting people to do them regularly. Uh, the problem that you face with most individuals in these testings is there's rarely an occurrence and people become complacent when they've done something a thousand times and they don't know why they're doing it anymore because they never find problems. So it's great when you find problems, but don't find them very often. Okay, then the accuracy test, which is done, every, it, which is done uh, annually, is usually done by the physicist, but could be done by the head technologist. And in this, you're checking with uh, two calibration sources that are traceable, to usually uh, cobalt 57 and cesium, to make sure the dose calibrator is responding appropriately for its correction factor. And um, that's got to be documented and signed by either the RSO or the medical physicist. Accuracies. Mm, Rarely test. The few dose calibrators that I have fail for some kind of internal electronic problems. Probably a resistor isn't allowing the unit to adjust for the full range. 
And, uh, but I have those calibrators that are 20 years old and zooming along, okay? If they're not abused, okay? 19 minutes left. Okay, let me tell you about my vacation. <laughs> repair, uh, repair our location. So I went over this in the repair our location. Again, the slide is here, and the, in, the, the type H DOT training emphasized on the bottom. I've had a couple of facilities uh, that's been an issue. Our state was very uh, aggressive about that. That's the same issue that's came up with the 450P and being able to return it to calibration because it's a pressurized chamber and it might release in the airplane three cups of air and I, I don't know, that maybe that's what that airline in Southeast Asia happened. I don't know, there was a 450P on it, depressurized and crashed the plane. I don't know. But uh, so they could now depressurize the 450P so you don't have to have E type H training to return it. They do to send it back to you, but you can uh, get from the company how to release the pressure from the chamber. And uh, that was your regulatory at work. Okay. Um, receipt um, here uh, on the new reg name of the organization, shipping material, rate of nuclei received, results of monitoring done in the instrument. You know, I have this fight with my state. And this is like when it comes, this is, this is one of the problems of getting old. Okay. Uh, those of you who are in my age category remember that we used to have monitoring of the surface and three feet and blah, 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 and, and individuals like myself would pitch a bitch that, you know, we received 30,000 packages and it's never been a problem. Why the hell are we doing this? You know, uh, unless an elephant stepped on the package, it's not a problem. And the, the NRC finally reneged and they said, you know, if it's a type, less than type A quantity, all you had to do was swipe the outer container. You know, it used to be the state would say you have to swipe every inner container. I'd say, well, that's good for about 20 seconds so the tech picks it up. You know, and now it's contaminated again. So why do we spend all that money proving it was safe for 20 seconds? Now, if you receive under type A packages, you just out swipe the outside of the package. But now comes our newly trained state regulators who've been to the school and they think, no, it's a really good idea to measure at one meter and at the package and swipe all the inner containers. And I'm going, we have been through this. Why are we doing this again? What changed? Where's the problem? Please somebody identify where the problem is. We're going to spend time and money not seeing patients doing this kind of stuff. Okay, PET CT requirements. Um, if you have the PET scanners, uh, you know, you're going to have the CT survey for those and the kind of exposure surveys, the mobile ones, which are very common in my region, add additional issues because you're, sh you're moving the thing every day or two days. So you've got to deal with the DOT survey and placarding of the vehicle. I've also have problems um, with where these mobile units get pa parked because they're basically designed to protect the techs. So they're shielded in the walls to separate the text from the CT scanner and the rest area in the front of the cab, but they're not shielded outside. So if they park it next to a building, especially with the second floor right above it, you're just looking down straight at all that stuff. There's no shielding between you and the CT scanner. There's no shielding between you and the pet patients. And you're a general worker, so the dose limit is 100 millirem a year. You know, and nobody thinks... <laughs> They park the cab there, you know, maybe that's a problem. So we've had a couple places where we had to, you know, look at where those PET scanners were going when they were parked at a, at a parking spot because they were overexposing people in the building. And not overexposing, what is that word? They were going to exceed 100 millirem per year, okay? And under the new joint commission requirements, that may be asked of you, did you look at when they brought a PET scanner on or a mobile CT unit? that it wasn't parked in a position where it created problems right inside the building? Okay, routine surveys. So we have a whole world of routine surveys from package receipt for contamination, a daily survey at the end of the day for use, that's an exposure survey, that's just to make sure nobody left anything out. Number one, they didn't leave a patient dose sitting on, they didn't deliver or they didn't put a, a kit back away or they left the flood source on the camera or whatever they were doing that day. Or they had some major contamination issue, which you find occasionally somebody spilled radioactivity all over the injection chair arm or uh, somewhere in the area. Or they threw a hot syringe into the regular waste. That's where people get caught a lot in state inspections is they'll come in and they'll find not large levels, but levels of contamination, you know, on the patient injection chair or somebody threw a hot syringe in the, in the, the regular waste in the, in the stress area and it's, you know, 20,000 counts per minute, but, you know, the state will make a big deal out of that. And they'll ask, although it's not required, did you survey the regular trash at the end of the day to make sure there wasn't radioactive material in it? 
So that can be another one they'll pick at you at. Weekly exposures and weekly contaminations are done to document issues with storage and use and radiation levels in and around the area. Our state wants you to at least at some frequency, and I usually do it uh, semi-annually, survey around the whole nuclear. So if the nuclear lab's on the other side of pathology, they want you to walk into pathology and say it's not over 0 0.1 MR per hour in that room or the director's reading room or one of my clients uh, up the pizza parlor next door which is a little discerning for the pizza parlor but you know that happens to be where the hot lab backs up against <laughs> that's an interesting discussion and so um, we also have the dot retirements and limited quantities most of the facilities that are returning pharmaceuticals to the, the pharmacy they're not they're usually qual uh, qualified as biohazardous waste to get out from the radiological standards on shipping them and they're not declared radiological to the pharmacy gets them but that doesn't usurp you as shipping them limited quantities and having to monitor them so um, that's another dot training requirement that most nuclear community la labs are doing that so the people returning it need limited quantity training on a two or three year basis depending on who you're arguing about with it. Uh, decay and storage requires monitoring regularly and of course patient moon monitoring and um, there's going to be another talk on some of the therapy monitoring and bethacum. And again, all those things have to have MDAs, limited quantities and response levels. It's not good enough to say I just did it. Uh, you demonstrate that survey meters or the contamination process assessment that you're using can detect the 2,000 or 500 in case of patient's room levels of contamination that are required. Or in shipping materials, your HDR sources when they come in, you ship, swipe the packages, they all have to be documented. Okay, so then we step in now uh, with accreditation and of course with the, um, the regulatory, we're getting down to a QA testing for the sodium iodide well. So we have accuracy, constancy, resolution, linearity, if uh, the mu unit will do it with your opium 153, the chi squared and the minimum detectable activity for that, that well depending on what you're doing with it. So if you're using your sodium iodide well to count your swipes, then that's where you're going to establish your MDA. If you've gone and bought a cap rack or a separate add-on well to your dose calibrator, you're going to do that with as well. So these tests are all required now and are included in accreditation, and, and they're also listed, I believe, in the new Joint Commission standard. The interesting thing about the new Joint Commission standard is that's going to add a new level of people coming around and asking questions who don't know what they're asking. So just another area to deal with on a regular basis. All those will be documented. Now, nuclear medicine therapies, there's a whole host of therapies out there coming and going, depending on your facility. Iodine, I still think, for hyperthyroid or cancer therapy, remains the largest therapy in most uh, community hospitals. But um, these uh, bone met therapies with strontium, yttrium, phosphorus is pretty old, but samarium and the new radium. Vigo therapies are all in play and all have requirements for them, including the patient discharge requirements, which are applicable. Even though you know the dose is not is way below the limit, you still need to go over it. Uh, and reviewing these, the process, the documentation, of course, the iodine is going to require bioassays, so you're going to have to establish a bioassay standard for the facility and how they do their bioassays, what their minimum detectable activities are, and how it's documented and reported. Um, the other therapies are going to have specialty issues with monitoring depending on what the facility has for survey meters. Okay, if you're using betas, you know, you're going to need a pancake probe that's pretty efficient for beta. It's not going to work with a, the so-called hot dog probe, the right-hand cylinder GM. It's not going to work well. But so you're going to need to be able to demonstrate that should you have contamination problems with any of those issues, you can deal with them and document them and measure them. Okay, I'm not going to talk much about this. I just mentioned it briefly. There's a whole talk later today. Is it later today on patient release or sometime? There's a whole, yeah, later in the meeting, there's a whole talk on the patient release documentation calculations and paperwork. So just make issue that it's applicable to all of those therapies. Okay, and then room surveys for I-131, um, you know, have to be done if you're going to in-house patients. And most facilities are using outpatient processes and only inpatient, in in-house, the most difficult patients who, you know, have some, they're mentally ill or they have some kind of major medical problem. And I've had at least three or four instances in the last five years of terribly contaminated rooms because the patient was mentally unstable and just 
threw radioactivity and peed on the floor and pooped on the chair and smeared it on the wall. And the one room was closed for a month or more before we could get it down to background levels. And uh, so unfortunately, when we in-house patients in my practice, they're usually the worst patients to deal with. And it often asking why we're doing that when we don't have to. Um, and again, you know, survey meter that's got to be able to find two MR per hour if you have radiation levels um, outside that area. Now, if you're still doing um, therapy with cesium brachytherapy in, in plants, um, you also have that requirement there. Those were, those were historically the more difficult. Most iodine patients can be put in a position in a facility where they don't create problems in other rooms. But you will need documentation and a map of how you house that patient. Okay, and then um, there's the record release requirements for that, which must document all of the things that you did, which the person is going to cover that will go over. And the room clearance survey, which also is applicable to brachytherapy implant sources, like the prostate, um, and documentation that all those surveys were done, the minimum detectable levels were there, and so forth and so on. The personal monitoring. Personal monitoring is... Uh, be a big thing with the Joint Commission in the state or the NRC, Time, not only who are you monitoring and why, but timely return of the badges, which is a war. Uh, the bigger your facility is, the bigger the problem is. I mean, this is a war in, at, at the VCU, MCV. Uh, smaller hospitals, when you know the people and you can threaten them, it works all right. But when you've got like 15,000 employees, it's very difficult to know them all and threaten them. Um, and, and averaging in when you miss a badge. so. Billy, Joe didn't return his August badge. You were supposed to average in an exposure for the previous and following month to estimate what their dose was. I will tell you that it's still in the regulations that if a person isn't properly monitored, the life, the, that person, if they should come after you, can assume they got the legal record and re legal limit unless you can prove they didn't. So if you don't have proper dosimetry records for an individual, they can say, I got 5,000 milligram a year while I work for you, which is not a good situation to be in. Uh, especially, I don't know what's transpired in that, what, what was it, Southern Methodist Hospital where they left the, C, the CT scanning, shielding out, and the techs are all suing for cancer risk with their lawyer. So it's, I don't know what they, where that's at, but that's an, going to be an interesting case. Because they bought a, a, from what I understand, they bought a private practice CT scanner that didn't put the shielding in the wall until the techs' badges started coming back. They identified there was no lead in the control booth wall. And so the techs have bound together with a lawyer to sue for their cancer risk so, as workers. So that'll be interesting. Because um, the meter report come. this is not a commercial endorsement for Landauer, but it is common. We'll say it's like Kleenex or because <laughs> I didn't say. So you need to go through the Landauer's meter report or whoever your badge company is to try to establish what exposures employees got at other facilities. This is a big issue with physicians in community hospitals because many of them work two or three places. And a lot of them today have, they do their difficult patients in the hospital and they have their own private outpatient interventional lab. And they may be getting more at that outpatient interventional lab than they are at the hospital, but it's your responsibility, all those employee registrants' responsibility, to make sure they don't go over 5,000 milligram a year. And I recently had a physician who was at like 4,800. And he, in, for reasons that I have yet to discern, he wasn't showing up in the summation. And I think it's because one of the facilities entered his social security number wrong. And so when it cross matched, it didn't see him. And he would have been over the legal limit had it seen him. So that can occur. You can think you're getting it, but you let, it was 02 and you put 20 and now it's not summing. So. Uh, worth being aware of when you're, in, and I only knew that because I knew the physician and I knew he had an exposure X at the hospital and I was in his outpatient office. I went, whoa, you know, that's a big number. Because then we have the ever wonderful declaration of pregnancy for workers, um, which you can or cannot a issue a second badge for the abdominal area, depending upon what kind of exposure that person's getting. I mean, people, uh, people, well, females declare their pregnancy um, and um, they're not getting any exposure to start with. They're getting like 100 millirem a year and they come down to declare their pregnancy to be protected from 500 millirem. You know, they don't get exposure of note. Whereas if it's a, you know, special procedures physician who's getting, you know, 12,000 millirem corrected with ED2, then you're going to be a lot more interested in putting a badge on that person's abdomen. Um, 
The other thing that's, that I pointed out is as we're considering going to 100 millirem for the term of the pregnancy as recommended by the ICRP or whomever, that really adds on the importance of by the time someone comes to tell you they're pregnant, they're not, it's not the day they got pregnant. It's maybe a month or two later, and now you enter them a pregnancy batch. Well, you've got to count that exposure beforehand, especially if you're going to be limited to 100 millirem, because a lot of techs are going to they're going to have an issue with that, and many physicians. So if they got they got pregnant in July and they're coming to see you in September, they have exposure to the fetus in July and August, and most people don't count it. They only count when they issued the batch. And that's probably okay because we don't get many people even approach 500 millirem. But if we go to 100 millirem, it's not going to be okay. And good, my last slide. So what's what's coming up, or what else are issues that I'm dealing out with here? Of course, we have the Sentinel event. What are you doing to monitor for fluoro dose and Sentinel event? How are you establishing dose limits if uh, you have a facility that's measuring Kerma or DAP? And what actions do you take? And I have a program in my practices on that. That's something that's reviewed quarterly. Also, most of the facilities are now, the Joint Commission is going to re require you to track fluoral doses on your patients and record fluoral doses and respond to fluoral doses. Uh, and we have a follow-up action level for the Sentinel event at about 500 rads. And um, that's reviewed quarterly on, from all the practice areas that have any notable dose. They report on people going over those levels and starting to benchmark and look at the variances in those levels between facilities. And the Joint Commission is saying you should be benchmarking these areas against some kind of stand national or international standards, and there is data on that as well. Um, equipment repair and maintenance in QC, uh, that some of the corporations have made that a big issue when equipment's repaired, and that is in the Joint Commission standard. It's not pushed on by a lot of the inspectors, but it is there, and we've been questioned, well, you have a document here that said QC was done on the gamma camera. What did they do? Did it pass? What did the service guy do? Did they provide you a report? Or it just says done. They wanted to see more documentation, and who reviewed it? Who checked to see that what they did was right? Okay, becoming a big area of and that is required in a couple of the corporations that any outage is covered by the Radiation Safety Committee. And if any major calibration was done, some kind of QA or medical physics review was done to see the units performing properly after whatever they did to it. And we just recently had um, an issue with a CT scanner where the servicemen forgot to put the auto dosing back on. And as luck would be, the first person scanned was a, a 10 year old. And they also had not adjusted the protocol backup MA and time for children. So with the auto MA off, it defaulted to the adult standard, and the child got about four times the dose they would have had if it was on and running. So there are the impetus of, you know, the servicemen's come on and say, okay, it's cool. You know, what do we do about that? So I've added to my daily ACR required CT testing that they run a pediatric abdomen on the GE Phantom in the auto dosing mode over this Phantom and come up they, from the day one they know it should have come up with this CTDI volume and this DLP and if it doesn't come up something's wrong with the automatic dosing system so that that's where you at least check it regularly and that's just adding a little another s series in the CT daily process it's a, you know a one look thing for the tech it's not a big deal. Uh, and so CT dosing, benchmarking, recording, that's all in the new Joint Commission standards. So that's going to become an expanding role that in most of my practice facilities is being taken up by the Radiation Safety Committee, kind of one stop to deal with all radiation issues. And I have 20 seconds, and then you can ask questions. So no. We're going to have the Sam's questions first, right? Yes, I'm sorry. We have Sam's questions. I forget we have Sam's questions. If you volunteer to take one, to give one of these talks, just remember you have to write five SAM questions and document the whole thing. So it's a little involved. It's, all right. So here are the SAM's question. Everybody got your clickers on the right channel. SAM's question number one of the five required questions. The RSC is not required to include an authorized user from each area if use permitted by the license, the radiation safety officer, a representative of nursing services, an authorized medical physicist if applicable, and a representative of the management. Go. Ten seconds. We should have the, the Jeopardy tune. Do, 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 do. Okay? 
And the right answer is number four. So 51% of you knew that the authorized medical physicist is not required to be a part of the rate safety. They're included in many facilities, but they're not required to be. Um, RS, uh-oh, did I just push back the slide? Thanks for the answer, no cheating. <laughs> okay, so the next question is going to come up now? That's not, that's not, that, that's the answer. Question's missing. That's. Everybody pick two. I, yeah, everybody pick two. The slides are, I don't know where the question went. The RS is always, uh, the RS, it was, the question must have been the RSO, the, the RSO is not charged with and chairing the RSC is the answer. So everybody got a hundred on that. And we, we, it's not till next year that they're actually going to start scoring your answers against your attendance. Just kidding. Okay. <laughs> now maybe we'll have a question. Okay. Sodium iodide routine testing does not include geometry, constancy, chi-square, linearity, or accuracy. Sodium iodide, well, routine testing does not include. Ten seconds can start, or you start? We've lost control of the system, friends. <laughs> the answer is number two again, constancy. Too many joints. Okay. And so we'll see if we have another question. <laughs> okay. Well, this, these are, what, 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 I'm really, okay. There's question three was geometry. Okay. Okay. A real question. Radiation levels in unrestricted areas must be less than. Radiation levels in unrestricted areas must be less than. Five millirem in an hour, two millirem in an hour, 100 millirem in a week, 50 millirem in a week, 500 millirem in a year. And I will denote that because some people get that wrong. Not two millirem or 10 millirem an hour, in an hour, which allows you to consider occupancy. Many people quote that regulation, 71% right, and I didn't have to tell you the answer. That's good. It is two millirem in an hour, okay? The yearly limit on five would have been 100 millirem in a year. Now, what a lot of people don't get sometimes on storage facilities is that 100 millirem in a year where the constant exposure is a lot less than two millirem an hour. It's like 30 micro hour an hour if it's a constant present source. So you have to be careful of that because the regulatory can get you on that issue since they dropped it to 100. Two, and there's the reference from 20 point, blah, 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 blah. Okay, the dose calibrator routine tests do not include, do not include geometry, constancy, chi-square, linearity, or accuracy. The dose calibrator. I'm trying to help you out here. It's early in the morning. Oh, did we? Oh, wait. Oh, oh, oh okay. Yeah, Chief Batch is going to get right up. Okay, I'm sorry. All right. Thank you. A timer was running, I assume. Yeah, 57% of you write high square tests are not done on the dose calibrator. They're done on the well systems. We won't discuss why you do chi square tests. Okay. Okay. We're running out of time. I'm over my limit. So uh, I've been advised by Jennifer that we will wait. I mean... Okay, I'm dead to her. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, so, bet we'll take on the therapy section. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bet. I work for a community hospital system in San Diego, California. Um, trained as a therapy physicist, hired there for clinical work in therapy. Um, along with that came the question, could you help us out in radiation safety and regulation? And I said, sure, I'd be happy to help because I'm a new employee. You always say yes, right? 22 years later, um, it has grown immensely. Now, of course, um, we're responsible for dose across the board, whether it's CT, nuke med, new therapies, clinical therapy, whatever it is. So it's grown quite a bit. So I had a question as I was listening to Dean. How many folk, I know everyone in here is a clinical physicist, I'm sure. How many are the RSO in a facility? 
Dang. How many are consulting to an organization and really do the work but aren't the really the, the RSO? So everybody in the room pretty much has responsibilities, whether it's um, diagnostic or therapeutic. Um, so my portion of this talk is more on the, um, the therapy end of things. But I do also do diagnostic um, radiation safety responsibilities for the hospitals. And um, at the end of this, we're going to have some a question and answer period where you can ask about any aspect of that, um, your practice. So how do I make this go to the green? So I wanted to start with a very long time ago when they started doing radium therapy, which now I think the Zofigo bear people would have um, a lot to say about this, how they do their radium dichloride therapy. However, historically, um, and even 20 years ago when I, when I began practicing, um, we weren't as regulated for the types of therapies that we did. And as a matter of fact, the reason that I was brought from a cancer center in Connecticut to San Diego was we had an um, incident where the regulators kept finding iridium sources in the local landfill. So my position was created because they were tagged back to the facilities I work for. And I met with the regulators and they said, do you work for... If you like what I have to say, I always say I work for Sharp Healthcare, but if you don't like what I have to say, I work for Scripps Healthcare. So that being said, they brought it back to my institution and they basically said, get a pair of boots because you're going to be really busy in this new job. And we found that what was happening is it was really easy for physicians to order sources on our radioactive materials license, have them de delivered to their office, used in their office, and then... So things have changed in 20 years, and I think the regulators have... Regulations have also increased to a point where it's kind of difficult to get away with that. But um, what I want to run through is if you're the RSO and you're in the facility and you're practicing where you know what your regulations are and you know what you have to do on a quarterly, monthly, weekly, annual basis, um, it, it is one thing. Um, the questions that I get for telephone calls is typically I'm, going, I'm new in this facility, they practice with A, B, and C, but they want to develop a new program. Can you help me with the regulations associated with that? And one of the slides that Dina had put up earlier it's not always just your state regulators or your Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Many times it's, it's knowing the Joint Commission standards, um, all of those other standards that go into place and practice um, for that particular area of um, what you'll be doing. But for the purposes of, of this talk for me, all the sealed source therapies that we do and all the things that we would expect to have um, in an audit for viewing when a regulator comes in, and what is supposed to be on that documentation if it's not already there. Has anyone in the room, I love these questions, has anyone in the room ever had a violation associated with their sealed source program? A couple people. Okay, more hands are going up. Um, it, it's not necessarily difficult in the sense of, I mean, it's not, you, it's not often where you've overexposed a patient with a sealed source. It's where you didn't keep your widgets the way they like you have you, for you to have your widgets aligned. So. That, there's a lot of um, what my hope was to deliver to folks was resources for you to go to to verify is your program actually compliant to today's standards and the, the um, website access for those. And again, these will be on handouts, I think, on the AAPM website afterwards. So you'll have all that available to you if you don't catch it right now. So as far as the um, sealed source that we typically use in... Um, Radiation therapy, it can go anywhere from eye applicators to prostate seed implants to localization for breasts, um, low dose, dose rate brachytherapy, um, again, your, your prostate therapy, um, high dose rate afterloaders, um, microsphere therapies and interventional radiology, gamma knife therapies, like so, or if you're um, fortunate enough to have an adaptive cobalt therapy unit. So there's a lot of different devices. Um, NRC and all the state agreement states are readdressing what their permission for an authorized user, or I'm sorry, for what a radiation safety officer is going to look like. So if you're coming into a program new and you're being asked to be placed on that license as the radiation safety officer, again, 20 years ago, you um, as an authorized medical physicist, pretty much if you were a therapy physicist, you could do anything in the therapy world, and there was a little pushback on that. It's not like that now. I mean, certainly it's per, um, whether it's HDR, whether it's LDR, whether it's microsphere therapy, they want to see what your practice as an authorized medical physicist is, and could you be an RSO over that? You don't have to be a medical physicist to be an RSO. 
but you have to have particular training and education in those modalities to be approved to be an RSO over that, that portion of, the, uh, of a program. So that will change also, change who does what. Um, for strontium applicators, what I find interesting is, and I, I do have the federal language here, state language is a little bit different. I'm from California, so we have our own state language specific to what we do with sealed, um, sealed source um, therapies and treatments. So what I think that the key um, message to take home is depending on the type of therapy that you're doing would depend on the regulation that would guide you how you need to be educated, how your physician needs to be educated. And in many instances, um, we have physicians that are like, you know, I'm going to be really busy down the hallway. Just go ahead and start the procedure. I'll be in when I can get there. So conversations on, am I really supposed to be the person doing this? Um, so how you write your language and your license is certainly crucial. You can either be more regulatory, um, restrictive to yourself, or you can be bare minimum at what the regulations state you must do. Certainly my recommendation is do what the regulations tell you to do. Um, you'll certainly need, need an authorized user physician. You'll need an authorized medical physicist. Um, where the line is drawn in the therapy world, most therapies certainly require a written directive. Um, how do you write that? Where does that belong? Is it, is it to be done before the procedure is done? And that, that, this is for all therapies, not just strontium eye applicators. I don't know if many people are still doing this. There's other devices that are being used. Um, source calibration, required QC, and although many times the regulators that come in and audit us aren't medical physicists or physicists at all, and they don't have um, an understanding, shall we say, of where um, issues could arise, um, th these are still required for us to keep, and at any time we could be asked to or be asked for them to look at any of this. Um, how long we keep things, um, record retention is always a question. Um, the NeoVista is a newer system that's being used for um, macular degeneration. Um, so what they what they the licensing for this is just a little bit different than it is for a strontium eye applicator. So having a program, and I don't know how vast the programs you are working in are, if it's um, simply an HDR um, system in your um, linear accelerator area and that's it, or whether you're doing um, other types of sealed source therapies. Um, they have the same backbone of requirements, however specific differences depending on the isotope being used and the strength of the isotope and how the written directive is expected to be written. Um, so these, uh, I put at the very bottom there, they decided that this would not be um, identical to the strontium eye applicator, so it's considered a dot 1000. A little bit different um, language in how you have to train your physicians and your physicists when that comes about. So. I-125, and anyone doing these in the room? I think these are, I think these are helpful. What typically happens is a patient comes in, they're going to have um, a, a tumor removed from their breast, and they localize that um, prior to the patient's surgery. If you're not using this system, it has to be done, they put a guide wire in the day of the surgery, and so it's the timing and the logistics of getting them into radiology, getting that done, getting them to surgery, and having everybody play nice. If you do use a program like this, the challenge is, well, how does your diagnostic radiologist get approved to be an authorized user to implement sealed sources? That's kind of a challenge. But in the, pa in the patient sense, it can be done a week ahead of time. And so scheduling isn't as um, restrictive, I guess, for this patient. So it's a little easier to do the procedure. However, getting your diagnostic radiologists listed as a sealed source um, authorized user can be a challenge. So it's been done, but it can be a challenge. Um, same thing, everything, there's guidelines for this. Um, authorized user, the specifics for him are specific. Um, the procedures, the records, the testing, where you get your sources from, the documentation, it's all the same in each one of these uh, modalities I'm talking about. As far as the um, brachytherapy, there's a couple that came to mind as I was thinking about this. Um, people are still certainly doing prostate scene implants. And now I'm not sure how many folks are doing microsphere therapies, whether resin or glass spheres. Is anyone in the room doing microsphere therapies? So there's a lot of that going on too. We also do that in the facility where I work. Um, so little differences between those. And again, it gets to what is the physician trained to do and is this really the area of expertise that they have? In low-dose brachytherapy, yes, it is your radiation oncologist that has been trained and approved to deliver that um, sealed source or multiple sealed sources. But again, when you look at this list, and this list is pretty much on every slide, 
It's your license specifically, your authorized user has specific training, and I get so many phone calls about, okay, I'm a, I'm a this kind of doc, but I want to do this kind of procedure, what do I have to do? And they're really closing that door of allowing a, phys a physician that's a radiation oncologist to just go ahead and do anything that's radiation oncology related. Um, it's very difficult to get a radiation oncologist that has only been identified for sealed source therapies to do a Zafigo therapy, which is a liquid radiopharmaceutical. So there's those challenges and how do we do this and how do we get them trained? Do they really need the 80 hours to do that? Um, so I don't know if any of you are seeing that um, or if they want to do a Zevalin in radiation therapy and they don't have authorized user on their board certifi or certificate and they haven't done unsealed source therapies, um, how do you do that? I mean, because does this belong in radiation oncology where they follow their patients or do we send them to nuclear medicine, have them injected and then bring them back down? So just the logistics of that and how your license is written to handle those new therapies. Um, medical events, um, it's defined a bit differently depending upon the um, procedure that you're doing. Um, certainly they list them as, it's pretty clear if it's wrong patient, wrong site, wrong motive of um, it, placing the source. 20% um, for entire treatment, 50% for a fraction. So there's a whole list of things depending on the therapy that you're doing, but um, they are there are definitely clearly defined um, regulations on what a medical event is. Uh, source calibration, required device QC, all of these things are things that you you routinely get a manufacturer's package and they walk you through all the steps that the regulators require. But I do mention to folks that they should verify that list with their state regulators. They want to make sure that that list matches what your state requires for that therapy. This is a DOT 400 um, for prostate. Intravascular microsphere therapy, where we kind of ran into a little bit of an issue. Same list, um, your authorized user, your interventionalist is the person that came to us anyways and said, we really want to do this therapy. Can, you know, how do we do this? Um, we want to be the people that are on the license. Well, again, they're a diagnostic interventional radiologist, and unless they've had training that indicates them as an authorized user, that's not going to easily happen in the eyes of the state. So they typically say, bring in somebody that has that approval on your license to oversee the procedure. Well, if you look at the detail of, of the regulations, it basically says only an authorized user can advance a radioactive source. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't think that my um, nuclear medicine physicians or my um, radiation oncologist have the training to, for vessel integrity as you're, for backflow, as you're pushing these things into somebody's um, a vascular system. They're, that's not their training. So of course our physicians, it's all the same group fortunately in, in the group of hospitals I work for, basically said that belongs to interventional radiologists so for patient purposes. It needs to be them delivering this. So how do we work this? We were able to get our interventionalists trained, documented, and then the manufacturer to come in and run through. Um, is, you said, many of you said you were doing these procedures. Using the little um, implantation device, training in that in so many cases and preceptored for that. So we were able to do it, but it wasn't straightforward. It was quite a challenge. It took us almost a year to get everybody ready to go. Um, until then, they did allow us to have the nuclear medicine physician in there, which really makes their day to stand there for 45 minutes while another physician does work. Um, but that's how we had to do it initially. So as you, if you're looking at, at beginning this, since there were a group of hands, it, there will be people to reach out to. I think that's one thing that's wonderful in this community is we can all reach out. We all do reach out to one another that do things ahead of us. Um, as far as emergency response, I mean, the only thing that I worried about in my interventional lab is my interventional technologists and my staff there are not trained in radioactive materials and they really didn't understand quite well um, why we were so reserved about them handling this, this device of a little tiny microspheres that could easily contaminate and close a lab. And it has happened. It hasn't happened to me, but it has happened. I've read about it. So um, just setting up the room um, as those of that are in the um, nuclear medicine world that paper and prepare a room for in-house therapy. Um, we do similar things for microsphere therapies. We do paper where, where the um, device is going to be just in case something happens. But I think, frankly, we put the fear of God in that um, department, so they're very cautious whenever these procedures are going on. And we do maybe two to three a month. So I think they have it down now. 
but they don't have the same freedom of running in and out of the room, doing their thing, going drinking their coffee in the control room, coming back in. They basically understand you're in there, you finish the procedure, we check your shoes, your hands, you're, and then you're done, you can go. Um, but setting that up was quite different than they were accustomed to. And I think that's part of the challenge is you have these new therapies, people want to do these new therapies and they don't realize the impact it's gonna have on the general um, group in their practice. Um, HDR requirements, um, these are pretty straightforward, I think. Um, certainly, um, most of you, if you're a therapy physicist, you're probably an authorized medical physicist on a license. Um, you're the physicist that does all the testing, the QC, the QA. You keep records of what you do. Um, the emergency response equipment, all of that's in your license. You told the state that you, or your regulatory body, that you would have the, um, the ability to manually retract this device if the source was stuck. Procedures, records, reports, who can do what. Um, can a um, medical physicist do the procedure from start to finish? Do I really need an authorized user in the room? Regulations are very clear on that. Only an authorized user can deliver a radioactive um, sealed source. So, or any, deliver any source at that point. Um, so HDR requirements, again, the same list. You've written your licenses. Um, of all of us that are, are um, clinical physicists and RSOs, how many have had to write a license for a facility? Yeah, so a lot. So all the details of what we promised we're gonna do and then we're gonna go back procedurally and make sure that they are doing, um, it, we all know very well what needs to happen and I think Dean kind of hit on that. You, you have a physician that sits in that position of physician RSO, if, if you don't have a physicist RSO in the building, and they're the person that's responsible for that um, program growing well, and they might very well not even know. They might not even know where the license is housed, much less with the content of the licenses. Um, so all of that falls to your medical physicist, whether it's therapeutic, diagnostic, um, it tends to fall to your medical physicist. Um, as far as procedures, um, records, reports, and enforcement, the enforcement component changed. It used to be that our Radiation Safety Committee um, and we do have therapeutic physicians and technologists that sit on that committee also, but they basically used to come for the free breakfast, frankly, because there was nothing going on in those areas. So now that we have even more um, responsibility with different therapies that they're doing, they're a little more interactive, but I think that the Radiation Safety Committee is certainly growing, again, due to the regulations or the recommendations by the Joint Commission that Dean brought up. Has anyone had to, um, bring back to their facility a gap analysis of here's what we're gonna have to do um, from the Joint Commission standards. Have, have we all looked at that? Um, whenever anything regulatory comes up, I always seem to be the person they bring it to and say, could you do a gap analysis? Here's where we sit, where do we need to be? And can you have that done by the end of the week? Um, the gap analysis is easy, getting it all caught up is tough, but um, so I think that it's gonna add a lot to our plate um, if you're also, even though I, you know, you clinically practice somewhere, if you're responsible as the RSO for all areas within a hospital, it's going to add a layer of oversight that, um, if you're not already doing it, is can be significant. Um, so, as far as the HDR, and I didn't put this list up here for me to read to you, or I just wanted you to see that for the once you get into the HDR world, if you're not there already, the level of detail that they expect in that program is quite significant, and they want the, all of these will be addressed in your licensing application. Um, oops, sorry. I think I just hit the wrong button. There we go. Um, so just the calibration procedures and how clear they are on what you need to do. And if you're doing HDR, you're well aware of this. If you've written the license, you're even more aware of this. And then the oversight of are they really doing this. One thing that um, I think is really helpful, there's several documents that are available. Again, I mentioned that earlier online that you can go to if you do need to have guidance or are requesting um, more information on is my program really the way it should be. Um, so I think at the end we'll talk about that too. Gamma knife requirements. Um, don't have that many gamma knives in the country. However, um, what this brings up for me, and we didn't talk about it quite yet, um, anyone in the room with blood cell radiators? And you don't have to tell me where you are. So there's this whole other program, um, increased control program, and if you don't know about it, you're very fortunate. Um, they, they basically track you moment by moment, day by day, not day by day, I'm being um, overzealous there. However, they have you look at that really high radioactive source that you're radiating blood products with, and they've changed after 911 the oversight that your radiation safety officer and committee has to have over that also. 
Um, and I know in California they came out, they said, you know, we're not happy that you have this parked in the back of the lab in a locked cabinet. We want it to have 24-hour surveillance. We want motion detectors. We want camera in the room. We're like, you got to be kidding me. Um, so it changed completely how that practice occurred. I can talk about it because we got rid of ours finally, so I'm not breaking any rules. Um, so that being said, that's another component of radiation safety oversight over radioactive materials that's not on everybody's radar. I mean, we knew it was a high dose source because I did the calibrations for it and annual surveys of it, but I mean, it wasn't um, something that I thought somebody was going to come in, put it on, the on their back and walk out with. It was a 700 Curie source, um, but it wasn't until um, they had the SWAT team, the fire department, the police department and a group of other people come to the facility and say, we want to meet with you about your blood cell irradiator. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Um, however, it was they had um, tested if uh, that source could be removed from that device. So they basically put a fake source in this device and they put a 17-year-old teenager in the room. And it took him 90 seconds to get the source out. Of course, my teenager can do anything. but. Um, I couldn't have done that had you given me a screwdriver. But so that being said, that really elevated their concern for how easy it would be to remove something like that. So not typical, not in all facilities. Many times your local blood bank will do all that radiation for you. But if you have an old um, device that's in your facility, a lot of facilities have moved to x-ray production to radiate the blood. But if those that are using the cesium sources, you know very well what those increased control regulations are and how it increases the frequency of your regulators coming to see you, and it also increases the um, like, or change in how they want you to oversee that device also in your lab departments or wherever you have it. My solution to all of that was if you're worried about somebody stealing it, put it out in the middle of the lab, and we have 24 hours. Of course, the lab people didn't want that. But so. um, as far as gamma knife requirements, again, I put this up here only because um, the bigger the source, the more you have of them, the more they want from you. So if you are um, regulating or the person that oversees that regulation, you want your auditing template. You know, when I started this 22 years ago, I said, they're all smarter than me. Who made the list of auditing? I mean, it's got to be out there somewhere. I should be able to find uh, the ability to audit every step according to every regulation and every advisory board and every standard. There should be a list somewhere. And then I realized Dean had it. So. Um, the, um, so the gamma knife requirements are quite significant. The other gamma knife that's coming into use, and what's interesting is when the NRC evaluates these devices, the gamma knife is a dot .600, I believe. Um, this, because of how it was designed, um, the NRC decided that this was going to be looked at a little differently for your, um, by, for your authorized users, for your physicists. So it's a little different, and the requirements are a little bit different. They require the testing, um, I should say the training, prior to use a little bit different than you do your regular gamma knife. So if anyone has, has put a gamma knife into practice, I think that, that um, that's something they've run into. It's not exactly the same, and your physicians have to be trained just a little bit differently also. And I think that's the curious thing, is they keep moving the cheese. You know, it's like, I think my doc can do that. No, they can't do that. Okay, I have to do this now. So, and that's always been the challenge. Adaptive cobalt therapy. Um, anyone out there working with U-Ray? Anybody have of U-Ray? This is the up and coming. Um, as the state of California is changing their RSO requirements of what training you have to have and can you be on the RSO on a license for particular devices, there's a couple of devices that they didn't consider. This was one of them. So we'll see how quickly they come into play in radiation therapy. But again, um, back to cobalt use and back to it being a sealed source and needing the same level of oversight as other sources that um, we currently have. Um, so I did want to, I think I'm going to Sam's next, am I? Oh no, same thing, the adaptive cobalt, um, a little more regulation, um, a lot more oversight. Um, so no matter what area of radiation therapy you practice in, whether it's putting an interstitial load in a patient's soft palate up to delivering um, um, HDR treatments to brain lab treatments to whatever you're doing to, um, it, it can be vast and the regulations differ depending on that as you well know as the training of your authorized users and your physicists and your, um, your staff also. So depending on how they have it licensed. Um, so 
The last thing I want to talk about, because again, it, it never ends, I think. Um, as a radiation safety officer, you're probably the representative that they call on to do the preparation for radiation or radioactive emergencies, proposed radioactive emergencies. If you're fortunate enough to have a safety officer that also has uh, physics background, that they would, might do that for your facility. But the one thing that is, was tasked to our radiation safety committee is not only CT dose, fluoro dose, radioactive materials dose, radiation therapy is also emergency department management. And anybody in here have to be involved in that for their facilities? Yeah, so we, we all have that. Um, a lot of good information if you are called as a resource um, where you can find already put together packets for you, um, deciding what is your role going to be in that disaster. You're likely not going to be on campus when something occurs, but you'll certainly be dialed directly um, if they do think it's an, an incoming event. Um, we do train all of our ED nurses. We do have a, um, a disaster preparedness locker in our facility that has um, GM meters and ion chambers. They understand the difference. They have digital decimeters that they know to wear. They know to be, they know what to do. Um, I'm just hoping we never have to test that, um, that plan. So I bring this to you only because if you are asked to put together a plan for a facility, there is a lot of resource to help you. Um, this is just a short list, which will be on your handouts if you download them, but they have um, several several places where you can go and design a program for wherever you are. Um, let's see. As far as RSO resources, um, this is what I was looking for about 20 years ago. Um, the NRC certainly has their documents, but the um, RSO toolkit, many of your, your states have an RSO toolkit or medical physicist toolkit or a toolkit for a particular device or a toolkit for a particular application you're adding to a license. You can find all of that um, locally or um, federally. The NUREG 1556 um, that came out, um, that's definitely a great resource for people that don't have the clear understanding of um, physicians, identification of physicians, he's trained to do this, can he do that? It's pretty clear on what they can and can't do and it sends you right back to what they expect to see on the training. I'm sure if you filled out an um, application for a physician to add him to a license, um, you've seen the list of things they expect to see. Nothing like asking a physician that's been practicing for 17 years if he understands what a dose calibrator is. Um, so it gets precarious when you, you know, when you want to add them. It's like, I hate to say it, but you're just too old. Um, so frequently asked questions, um, also a great thing to download and take a look at if you have any. And I'm ready for Sam's questions. <laughs> and I hope mine work right. So. I go to the question. I sped talk. I'm going to tell you, I sped talk. Okay, first question. Ophthalmic treatments using strontium-90 may be performed by an authorized medical physicist per 35490 or your state equivalent. They may be performed by an authorized user by your state agreement, a dosimetrist by NRC or your state agreement, a technologist, the janitor, no, um, an authorized dosimetrist per um, 35, 490 or equivalent agreement state. So who gets to do the um, strontium applicator? Go. 10 seconds, yeah. Awesome. So even though many of us have been asked to be there and to do that, um, it's an authorized user. Author only an authorized physician can do an application with radioactive materials. So awesome. So there you have it. Uh, next one. Intravascular uh, microsphere therapies. Now again, these are little baby, not little, lots of little spheres being administered. I'm not doing anything. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, here, I'm going to put them right here. So, the intravascular microtherapy, um, little tiny spheres, beta emitters are going to sit in the liver. Um, so here's the question. I'm about to release my patient. They've been in the, we call it the spa in my hospital. They've been in the uh, let's stay here until you're ready to go home place. and. 
patient exposure rate measurements prior to patient release are not required for microsphere therapy procedures. They're not required if the patient remains hospitalized. They're not required, I'm sorry, required, and documentation is also required. Number four is required, but you don't have to document it. And number five, not required if the patient is returning to a nursing home. So the real question is, are they required? Um, and your answers? Yes, they are definitely required. And you also have to document it. When do you have to document anything or date it or sign it? That's my question. So um, interesting, a lot of places believe that they're not required because you've consistently shown that the measured exposure rate on my last 50 patients has been at like 0.5 MR per hour. Why do I have to keep doing this? And oh, my answer, because 10 CFR tells me or my state regs tell me, doesn't matter what you have consistently. Your license is regulated by us and we tell you you have to do it. So yes, you will need to take in a measurement. Will you get an exposure rate where you will not be able to um, release your patient? I've not had that happen in hundreds. I don't know if anybody else has had to, hundreds of patients. We've always had an exposure rate that's well below regulatory limits to release. Next one. High dose rate remote afterloading brachytherapy procedures do not require a written directive. They require a written directive from the referring physician or the referring medical group, require a written directive from the scheduling department to reserve the device, require a written directive before implantation to include the treatment site, the radionuclide, and the intended dose. Number five, they do not require a written directive for inpatients. And your answer? Excellent, yep. And, you know, it can be, they require written documentation. That's what we'll, we'll go to that, yeah. Um, as stated in 10 CFR 3540 or your equivalent agreement, agreement state regulations, a written directive has to be written and signed. I don't know if any of us scan them into our electronic documentation to prove that it was done before we treated. However, that does have to be done before the patient comes in the room, we get them all ready for a load. There has to be a plan. Um, including the nuclide and the intended dose. Um, and last but not least, um, HDR after loading brachytherapy procedures. At the close of the procedure, the regulations require you do not, do not require a survey of the patient to confirm the sources have been removed from the patient and returned to the shielded storage container. Require leak testing of the source following each treatment procedure, require leak testing of source before using the device on subsequent procedures, require a survey of the patient to confirm the source has been removed from the patient and has been returned to shielded storage, or number five, require a wipe test survey of the treatment room following each treatment procedure. Are we good? We'll start the timer, yeah. Excellent. Yep, they want to make sure it came out of the patient, went back to where it's supposed to be. Um, for obvious reasons, we've had a couple of events with those procedures. Um, so yes, 10 CFR 35604 requires that we have to take a look at our patients. Um, a couple of things that, um, I think that's my last SAMS question. All of my SAMS questions initially were true and false, and then I read the directions. <laughs> and it was, <laughs> and it was, really? So, sorry for all the words. Um, last one, I think. Sealed source leak testing of brachytherapy sources. Sealed source leak testing is not required for brachytherapy sources. Sealed source leak testing is performed only by the source manufacturer. Sealed source leak testing is required monthly and following each brachytherapy procedure. Sealed source leak testing is required at intervals not to exceed 12 months. Sealed source leak testing is required at intervals not to exceed six months or at other intervals approved by the NRC or an agreement state in the sealed source and device registry.
correct. And 77% correct. And it's every six months, and typically we do our sealed source inventories at the same time. And that's documented for every six months. Um, you're looking at them, you're wiping them, and you're putting them away. Now, there's a, one caveat I thought of after I wrote this and sent it in, in what, two years ago? Or in January. Um, the, 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 um, there are sources that you can have. If you have, like, cesium sources that we used to use years ago for, um, gynecological implants and they're like sitting in a cave somewhere and they've been there for the last 20 years nobody's touched them you can get an exemption for continuing to wipe them um, so that wasn't in this however if in, in you got the answer right anyways but there are exceptions if you you requested that and it's been approved for you to move them into what's called a archive position so you don't have to wipe them every six months um, so before we go to a answering or answering question session, um, one of the things that, uh, again, when I came to this hospital group, it was for a completely different purpose than probably the purpose I serve for them now and have been serving. Um, so the whole radiation safety end of things, and as a physicist, what you're dragged into, um, I, in the diagnostic world, in the therapeutic world, or both worlds, um, I'm sure Dean has several also. But I did have a couple of events I wanted to share with you in our last couple of minutes. Um, what do you do when you, you, you basically you have a patient that a physician wants to give 200 millicuries of iodine to and you're like, the patient is not doing well. I don't know if you're aware of that, but they're like really, really close to not being with us any longer. So why don't we not give them 200 millicuries of iodine? So we inadvertently gave a patient 200 millicuries of iodine and within 90 minutes the patient passed away. So I'm okay with, you know, biological excretion and all that. Now what do you do with the 200 millicuries in someone that passes and all the regulations associated with that? Um, basically, I said, you know, they're not going to stay in the morgue forever. Um, it was a patient, I live in San Diego, it was a patient that lived in Tijuana, Mexico, and they wanted the patient to come home. So all the regulations associated with that. Uh, yeah. So it, it can get, it can get curious. Um, the other question we've had before is we, as a hospital institution, we take care of all the um, state prisoners. So not all of them, but in San Diego County. So what do you do when you have an I-131 patient that has to be in-house because you can't send them back to the jail yard with I-131, 150 millicuries, but then they have to have armed guard support, visual armed guard support. You're like, Why don't, what is this? Where do these come from? So you have a patient that is handcuffed to the bed. Um, it keeps contamination down, that I'll say. Um, but you also, the guard that watches them, um, all of a sudden they're like, well, how did I get into this job? So literally they're going through their contract looking for, does it include um, medical exposure to an isotope that wasn't intended for them? Um, and then the other thing that I, I didn't mention throughout this is in many instances where you are a consulting physicist and you do come in and look at um, certain aspects of a program, you can have the radiation safety officer give you a delegation of authority letter identifying in our state, I can't speak nationally, maybe you can, Dean, they can identify all the um, things that you can do for that program such that you don't have to keep running to them saying, could you sign this film badge report? Could you sign this linearity testing? They can delegate that to you or to someone else, um, and that is sufficient. Um, verify that, but that can help if you're having that struggle with trying to connect with that physician. And then last but not least, uh, we purchased a superficial device for our radiation therapy department and of course we were going to do the acceptance testing and I was doing the acceptance testing with the manufacturer and we had, um, I had turned on the 450p to kind of bring it to background and beamed on the device so we could warm the device up and I'm like, huh, you tell me beam on that thing is like pegging the um, 450p. So come, come to find out the manufacturer turned to me and he goes, you know, I'm really not sure, but I don't think there's any lead in these walls or any lead in this glass. He said, you probably want to call your RSO. So yes, as it turns out, I said, well, you're done, because here I am. It did turn out that the people installing the equipment, um, even though the documents said you must have leaded glass, you must have, the, the lead glass was not leaded, the walls are not leaded, the doors are not leaded. So in line with the um, changes for Joint Commission, um, beaming on and checking around the room, I think is a good idea. I mean, in older facilities, you've got regular density concrete and it's not an issue um, with what's above or what's below, but in many instances you'll have the, you know, linear accelerator on one side and the egg, egg bank on the other. So in that case, it's, it's a bad day. 
But um, that's all I have. I think we're going to move to questions. Or should I? I'm going to. Thank you very much for your time. Hi. Is this on? Good. Yes. Um, two comments and a question. In our state, um, we have a vast immigration exodus of RSOs. <laughs> and that these physicians who are not employees of the hospital anymore, but just consultant groups as you know, any outsourced uh, um, modality, they just do not want to do RSO duties. So it's a struggle to get anyone named as RSO. So that's the... That, well, that, that was, I made like nine notes. Yeah. I made but, like nine notes, and that was one of the things I made note of is, is that problem, and, and as the consulting medical physicist, who are you responsible to point problems out to? Because often you, I will think the RSO is not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Or worse, the technologist is not doing what they're supposed to be doing, even though I've tried numerous times to get them to do what they should be doing. But, you know, who, who are you going to go to? Who are you responsible to go to the management who's running the facility and say, Dr. Smith's are not really qualified to be RSO, or, or Peggy's a terrible nuclear medicine tech and she's not doing half the tests. You know, when your license is in, is in trouble because of this, but, you know, I like Peggy, but I don't want to cause her to lose her job, but, you know, my responsibility is to point out where the license is in trouble to the management. And, and, and uh, of course, the buck always stops there. You can't fight with the management, but at least you've fulfilled your responsibility to report a, a problem. Right. And along that line with the, one of the things that Beth said about these letters of authority, we just can't, got handed a VA document saying, this is what you will do. And uh, I told my boss saying, they can delegate authority, but they cannot delegate responsibility. Right. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, a, right. that's, that's a straight that's right. legal thing. Yeah. So my question is, with the uh, new ABR certificates, uh, I heard rumor that uh, with the ABR certificates that you're automatically authorized to, um, you know, be granted uh, authorized user ship for Group 100. What about, what about Group? The uh, RS, uh, the ABR, and the the um, number of the certification certificates say if you're RSO or authorized user eligible, you still have to be precepted. Right. You still have to be precepted. Nobody gets around precepting. So, but there's all the boards list on Part 35 where you have to look on their certificates to see if they're legitimately meet the training requirements. We still have to precept them. Even the RSO, and, and that's becoming a problem in community hospitals. You know, it used to be that any authorized user was eligible to be RSO. That's not the case anymore. They also have to meet the RSO eligibility, which means they have to be precepted. So I often say to a lot of hospitals, let's face the facts. You know, Dr. Jones could be hit by a truck tomorrow. Who's going to be RSO? You need to have some backup RSO process in this group so we're not dead in the water. And, and that board process is within seven, the seven previous years you would have AU put on your ABR certificate. And if not, there is another pathway that you can become an RSO. It's just a little more laborious. Okay, we're over to the gentleman in the dark suit. Jack Thank you both Jean. for a, a great and very detailed information about RSO, Radiation yes. Safety Committee, who's responsible for what. I have uh, one question for Beth and also an interesting note about Zafago. Um, the first question for Beth is on, on your list of requirements for a license for HDR. The first thing on your list was uh, daily spot check on yes. HDR. Yes. So are, is, are you saying no. that you need to do a daily output no. check? on daily what was use. That? So it, it is, if you're using it daily, it has to be done daily. If you well, and and are you mean an actual uh, output measurement on the HDR unit? No, it's a, the, it's a con more like a constancy check. Is what? A measurement or just a calculation? Calculation. Okay, thank you. Yes, That's you a clarification. Yes. Then the interesting note about Zafago, which is, as most of you might know, is a fairly new therapy. Um, the release criteria uh, determined by the manufacturer and their calculations were based on sort of a normal patient with normal biologic function. And we had an interesting case in our facility where the patient's illness um, uh, had her having renal insufficiency. And, um, and so she was admitted as an inpatient. We had the opportunity to measure her daily um, and noted that after a week, she was still hot to truly release. 
if um, by by you know outpatient release criteria, and I thought that was kind of interesting and a note to the. Uh, prescribing physician to make note of a patient's medical condition in, tor in, their, excuse me, in order to release them right there after giving them esophageal treatment because they really may be too hot to send home if that they're renal insufficient. Yeah, when Beth was talking yeah. about the 200 millicuries of the iodine, that's a more difficult procedure. That six, six series treatment is highly dependent on all the blood variables, the chemotherapy. It's a very complex therapy and the, the authorized user in the uh, radiation oncologist or chemotherapist who's working with them, that's not a simple therapy. It has a lot of problems. Just as an interesting note. <laughs> and candidacy for them is pretty select for the Zofigo patients. Um, also, the release criteria, I mean, typically if you have a physician that is certainly working the endocrine component of that, that um, patient's issues very much comes into play with any liquid radiopharmaceutical. So, Renal insufficiency would have probably negated that patient from being treated in our facility. And that's a nuclide you yeah. don't want to spill because yeah. radium chloride is going to bind like crap to everything. And you also don't want to <laughs> infiltrate that. So the, the yeah. other piece of that is you want to make sure a brand new IV is placed and that IV is, is functioning well before the physician begins the push. Because the one thing we did talk about earlier is the I-131. When you have somebody show up at your back dock saying you're releasing stuff that are hot, one thing we found at our campus is that when our nuclear medicine techs would inject into any kind of tubing or any kind, we would find many times that that tubing would be inadvertently removed by a nurse and tossed. So we've moved into a practice of anything that we inject into has a little tiny dot put on it. It's not an external hazard to anybody that works with it, but it can't be released from a facility in most cases. So we've identified them as, as possible contaminants. So just same thing for the alpha. The young man in the blue shirt. What's your advice for RSO um, when physician during the diagnostic procedure or international procedure doesn't wear the badge? What? Oh, God, I don't wear your badge game. I play this game all the time. This is a game that you have to go to administration for because I, have, I am dealing with this at my own institution. Physicians not wearing badges, not returning badges, blah, 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 blah. But the ultimate authority for responsibility is with the administration, the registrant if it's x-ray or the executor of the license if it's nuclide, and usually they, they have an overlapping rule. And they, they're where you have to put the, in fact, I have a meeting with my CMO when I get back about this whole issue because, you know, we don't have authority to beat the doctors up. I'd like to have it, but I don't. And, you know, we don't have the people to chase around two or 300 people with badges every month going, you don't have your badge on. A lot of facilities uh, have started as part of the timeout yeah. that I deal with. It's a timeout that starts the procedure. The question is, do you have your badge on? And, and will the administration stand behind the nurses not starting the procedure if the physician doesn't have the badge? We are trying that. But I mean, and this is always a problem with contract physicians, the group contracts, is they're really recalcitrant about compliance. There's no magic thing, but I always say, you know, we don't allow them to do the procedure naked, so we have some rules. Mm -hmm. We can start there. The administration forces them to do some things. This has to be in that process. But this is what I was saying about what's your responsibility. Your responsibility is to clearly have documented to the administration this is a failure because this is liable to start becoming a check off on the Joint Commission when they come mm -hmm. in, they're very interested in floral doses, floral procedures, you know, are you wearing badges? If somebody doesn't have their badge on, you got a problem. And we now you got a bigger problem than just that physician in the regulatory. You get That's going to be a hit on the Joint Commission. You get too many hits, you lose your accreditation. They'll be very serious about that. We had two interventional radiologists have radiation-induced cataracts. It changed the scenario at our facilities. Um, but we also did, um, we placed it on them, literally. It's a job of one of the staff x-ray technologists is to take the, the badge and put it on a physician. Seems ridiculous, but it, they were also very interested after those two physicians um, had the events occur. So um, without that having happened. I'm glad Lynn then, came up, because I have a question for you. First, I get my comment. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask your question first, but I had a question as a, a <laughs> record to one that something bad said. Go ahead. Um, Actually, I don't have a question. I have two clarifying comments. Mm -hmm. um, authorized medical physicists are not required under any Part 400 use. Um, they are only required to be on a license for Part 600 uses. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple of breath slides had AMPs listed as um, required under a Part 400 use. That is incorrect. There may be a couple of agreement states that have opted to require an AMP. and. 
off the top of my head, I haven't looked at that recently. Um, Debbie and I will do a survey of the agreement states to determine in the next couple of months how many states have added a requirement under their Part 400 um, regulations to require an AMP, so we will follow up on that before the July meeting. Um, two, anything that is under Part 1000 under NRC is guidance only, and the agreement states do not have to follow it or comply with it. They can do anything they want. That is one of the issues that we have with um, newer modalities being put under Part 1000 and nothing ever coming out of Part 1000. Mm -hmm. The intent of Part 1000 was to provide a quick licensing mechanism when a new modality is uh, market available. However, the intent was never for that to stay in Part 1000. It was to always be moved to Part 35 and be codified because um, another problem with the Part 1000 requirements is they do not go through a public, public comment period, so NRC can write the guidance any way they want. Um, they do get discussed with the Advisory Committee on Medical Use of Isotopes, but there really is no public comment period on that. We continue to raise this issue with the NRC every chance that we get. The other thing is in um, Tuesday's regulatory update session, I will be addressing a couple of points that have come up um, that I heard yesterday in the ROPA meeting and um, hearing this morning. I'm going to change some of my slides a little bit to address some of the points, um, but there is changes in the proposed regulations coming down to um, doing away with the attestation statement for any authorized user, RSO, AMP, or authorized nuclear pharmacist if they are board certified and have the eligibility requirements. That's in the new Part 35 changes. There are going to be some comments requested on that, so just a heads up on that. So, Dean, what's your question to me? When we were talking about increased uh, control regulations, one of the things that's always concerned me is the flirting with including HDRs in that. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you had any insight, because if they do, that's going to be a huge jump for a lot of facilities that are not in this game, and it's a very serious and complicated game. Uh, it's not only flirting with HDR, but it's flirting with down to one-tenth of Category 3, and that issue is not dead. Um, although at, the t at this time, the commission directive is not to go below category two sources. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the new category two source that has come into play is the V-Ray um, system, which is, if you don't know, it's a three-headed cobalt machine with a 5 tenths T uh, magnet, um, up to 45,000 curies of cobalt. Right now, there are only three units in the U.S. The first is up and operating and actually treating patients in, at Wash University in St. Louis. The other two centers are U University of Wisconsin and UCLA um, to be getting them. Wisconsin's number two, UCLA's number three. Um, if you have any questions, I have a presentation I can post if anybody wants to see what the regulatory challenges are with you, Ray. Um, Dean, there is unfortunately still rumblings at the commission level. We still have a couple of commissioners who believe that um, we are not um, regulating sufficiently as low in the category scheme as we should. There is still also, um, unfortunately, key congressional staff that also believes that um, all the way down to category five should be regulated. The good news is right now we have a very dysfunctional Congress, so don't, I don't expect to see anything. <laughs> Haven't we always? <laughs> uh, more so than ever. Um, so I don't expect to see anything coming um, recently, but um, it's really a possibility and it is gonna be a major nightmare if we have to go below the category two sources. And I wanted, before we took another question, I wanted to add a caveat to what Pat said in RSO training. If you have a facility in states that only allow one RSO, and it ends up being an authorized user in nuclear medicine who's a radiologist, and you have therapy, that person has to be trained in all the emergency procedures and issues with the therapy equipment, which a lot of facilities don't do, but you'll get caught by the state for that. They need the emergency training for the HDR or the gamma knife, and they need to be TNR'd and all the other issues. Right. The good news for that also is part of the proposed revision to Part 35, which hopefully is going to be out within the next 30 days for comment. Um, there is a specific change to allow for an associate RSO to be listed on the license, and um, 
some agreement states still allow that. It has not been enforced yet as a compatibility level item um, under the agreement state oversight review process, but um, NRC has recognized that. And actually a lot of the legwork that was done to move NRC in this direction had actually been done by Ralph Lido while he was the uh, medical nuclear physicist representative to NRC's advisory committee on medical use of isotopes. So stay tuned because there are a couple of specific questions in the proposed rule that um, NRC is asking for uh, clarification on. Thank you. Right. Gentlemen. Dean, uh, did you say that when you receive packages like, say, a Viodine 131, you only wipe test the outside of the package? If it's not? under type A quantities, yes. I, I, have, an interesting, I have an interesting case. because I Unless have, it looks like an elephant case. Because I've, <laughs> I've, I've, I've only got about five years of experience. Okay. And, um, or if and you're licensed differently. You could be licensed to have the uh, additional requirements. Yeah. But I did, I did receive one package. Even though our license didn't require it, I would wipe test at three different levels. I would wipe test the outside of the package, mm -hmm. the pig, and then the inner vial that, I mean, I was going to hold on to and hand to the patient, right? Mm -hmm. So I wipe test the outside of the package, I get 20 counts, counts per minute. Mm -hmm. I wipe test the pig and I get 100. I wipe test the vial and I get 22,000. Mm -hmm. So it's Well, remember possible. there's no contamination <laughs> control issue, sons. Once you open the package, you're supposed to be wearing gloves. Uh, you're right, right. And there's no guarantee you don't have dirty pharmacists <laughs> who are not getting things contaminated. So, but you, that, you know, especially when you've, wiped, you've checked the outside, you take it out of the box, then you check the box before you throw it into the trash. Of course. But, you know, I would never assume anything's not contaminated. And, you know. and in this, I'm in the state of California also, and I'm listed as an AMP for dot four hundred use. We have a strong ninety eight. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, cool. Run out of time. Yeah. The gentleman. Yeah. yeah. And just a comment on return badges. Um, I had the same situation where people don't return their badges, especially the orthopods and the surgeons. Mm. So what I did was uh, twice a year I did a study for three months, uh, ba put badges all over, including C arms in an OR. Every OR room was monitored for three months. And I proved that uh, the exposure of any individual in that room, uh, including the surgeon standing next to the CR, will, uh, I mean, uh, CM will never get 10% uh, of the maximum permissible dose. Took those data to the radiation safety committee and told them that uh, these people really, if we don't monitor, uh, it will be all right because we meet the regulation. We still monitor them, but I have those documents to show to the regulators and joint commission that. If they don't return the badges, I really don't care because uh, I've proved that there is no exposure there. So I'm going to wait for the next uh, JECO to see how that goes. Unfortunately, most of the people I'm having badge problems with are in interventional and cardiology and pain management. They get notable doses, right. thousands the, of millirem. The, my cardiologist and uh, interventionalists are not a problem. They were educated really well, so they do use their badges and they use all their protection devices. The question I have, and that's a different topic, it's on the SERS sphere. Uh, right now I'm investigating an incident where a patient came in in August, a single dose, um, uh, the, all the interventional has done a pri um, uh, mapping and everything was perfect. Patient came back in uh, October, no mapping was done. Again, the angiogram showed that uh, um, the, the, all the vessels were intact and there was no backflow. Uh, February patient came in with a severe anemia and now I'm investigating the uh, ulcer in a duodenum because of the surfsphere. The, the pathology showed that there were some uh, um, uh, beads in the lesion where they took a sample. Question I have for those who are doing microspheres, uh, have you en encountered any of this situation? Have you attempted to do the dose? And um, uh, have you looked into those beads? Surprisingly, the beads were measured 100 to 140 micron in reality, those are 25 to 60 micron beads. So now the issue was, uh, where, where did I get those beads? Why the beads are so large? And investigating, I found that the procedure in the pathology, when they prepare the slide, these beads are exposed to certain chemicals, formaldehyde and other stuff, and they might have swell up now. So there, there's so many things that I'm looking into right now to write a report, because state wanted me to exhaust everything to find out how much does this patient got? And was it really microspheres? Anybody has any information? I, were they glass or were they resin? Uh, they were resin. Resin. Oh, resin. Yeah. I don't. 
I don't know. I, I've not had. I any could speculate, guess, but that yeah. we're running out of time. Yeah. Well, I, I think they, they came from Microsoft. There's no question about it. Because I started looking into any other therapies that she received. Because there are resin beads uh, tagged with certain medication right. for a chemotherapy that they use. Mm -hmm. And uh, I couldn't find in the patient history that she was treated anywhere else for uh, any other uh, type of therapy. So but at this point, I have to assume that they, these are microsphere or these are surspheres, mm -hmm. and I have to assume that they swell up because of the chemical reaction. Well, in order to give these guys a chance, we're running two minutes left, so let me get these questions. Okay. Anybody, anybody yes. has any information? Okay, thank you. Can you comment on the level of activity for small sources and what is the requirement for leak test? Let's say you have a check source that you use once every two years in your inventory. Um, uh, what is, can you, can you tell us what is 100 the, microcuries of beta gamma. And how, how, is it how 20, often? 10 or 20 for alpha emitters. And how often do they need to be leak, leak tested? Six, six months, months if you're using them. If you don't use them? Six months. If you're going to put them into storage and you're going to have to declare leakage yes. at the time of storage. Right. If you put them into and storage. depending on the state, five to 10 years. Okay. Or uh, you can, in best case, get extended storage. But I was going to comment on that because a lot of the states are going after that because that's how radioactive material gets lost in the long run. Mm -hmm. It kind of gets put in this, and then the rent department gets moved, and it gets moved over there, and all of a sudden nobody knows where it is. So they become very aggressive on if you're not using stuff, get rid of it, unless you can legitimately hold it for decay and, by the law. And our, in our case, it was we were released from wiping it, but we were not released from doing an area survey of that area to verify that there's still radioactivity there. Yeah. So we had to be... Seed by seed, we were not assured, but we were assured that there, it was still present in that locker. We've been told in at least three incidents, get rid of those sources. Unless you have some legitimate reason to have them, get rid of them. Steve? Quick uh, response to Beth about the cataracts. Society of Interventional Radiology is going to do on-site cataract exams mm -hmm. the end of the month. Wow. Uh, encourage your IRs to sign up for it. Uh, those who have Landauer badges, we've asked that they bring their ID card because the society's made arrangements to try and track their lifetime exposure. Those without Landauer badges, they should bring enough information so we can track to see what's happening. I have a question for you too, Steve. Um, I teal these on glasses. Two questions I've been asked. Um, for my interventionalists, should they be wearing ITLDs and mm -hmm. is there at any point gonna be a Webster type calculation that would take into account a leaded glass for their eye, if they're 100% use of it. There's That's been tricky. several studies around the world, including one we've done and not published, but others have been published. Roughly the collar to the inside of the glasses, a factor of three is okay. a conservative estimate. Okay. So I rely on the collar badge. Okay. Thank you. S since right. dosimeters, hang on, I got one thing to add. Since dosimeters have been brought up and you've harped on, you know, returning them, uh, one of the manufacturers has a Bluetooth dosimeter that does not have to be returned for processing, and the other manufacturer, I understand, will have something NVLAP accredited very soon. Mm -hmm. Have you investigated using those? I hate hurting cats. I've we, got We have. They'll still lose them. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And they still won't wear them when they have to go by the scanning site. And I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced they're cost effective for us with 700 people on badges, but you know, it, it, it's an issue. I've looked at them. Have we'll you looked continue at to see if they're cost competitive. The USB version or the Bluetooth? The Bluetooth. Okay. Aren't you a beta test? She's a, a beta test for that. Yeah, beta you can talk to her. I wanted to add two, three things here to let you run out of the room. Okay. Beth ma mentioned the disaster planning integrated program. I want to remind you all that most of the equipment the hospitals have was bought under federal funds and you don't own it. And if you lose it, you have to replace it. Because I've had this come across with hospitals that were bought meters for their ERs and no one could find them. They were $2,400 meters. Well, you got to go buy another one because the Joint Commission is asking to see this equipment because Congress has plunked out, I don't know, 200. I know my hospital alone has got nearly $9 million since the onset of this program. And most of it is equipment and they want to see it. Show us this Geiger counter, show us this, this tent you bought to transport bioterrorist victims. You know, they want to see it and it's got stored away or it gets lost. And you don't own it, they own it. So if you lose it, you've got to replace it. And when you can't find that $2,200 Geiger counter, you've got to buy a new one. So, you know, that's being asked by the Joint Commission. The other thing I wanted to mention was been pushed a lot about RSO signing medical physicist reports. I, like most of you, may send a report about nuclear medicine or whatever, and they want to see the RSO signed it, that they reviewed it. 
They want to see a signature on it, even though it may be addressed in. The other one I wanted to add was um, my biggest area of challenge with radiation exposure recent is pain management, pain management clinics. They opening like candy stores uh, in many areas. And although their procedures are not long, I have people who are doing 60 to 90 cases a week and only they're a couple minutes a case. Their geometry is very poor because they're doing injections in the spine and they raise the eye eyes up, causing a lot of spacing. And, and apparently Johns Hopkins teaches them all when they swing in a lateral view to stand on the x-ray tube side and lean on it. So, um, and that location is about 200 MR an hour. So you start doing two hours of work a week, you're gonna have a huge exposure. And I had two of them almost go over the state limit before I had sat down and had a talk with them. So as I predicted in the past and other people have, the advent of moving special procedures type equipment, mobile C-arms that are basically cath labs on wheels into private practice offices is happening more and more and more. And all ulcers were the issue of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Back pain is the issues of this millennium and it's become a big business. Other questions? I heard we have a delightful break, so. One, one final thing, um, Monday morning at 7.30, the diagnostic session will focus on releasing patients and also uh, patient dose monitoring software. So you heard a couple pieces about that today. There will be a really deep dive into that Monday morning. So thank you. Thank you.